thank you very much and good morning. So I'll skip through the introductory slides here about, I think you could read the course description and the learning objectives. There's quite a few of them. We actually extended it to two pages, so there's a lot to read about. We really like to play off the, uh, the theme of after the honeymoon life cycle planning for your, your, for your new healthcare facility and think in terms of it as a, a game. Is it a game? We're dealing with data, we're dealing with life cycle, and we're gonna be talking about mastering the life cycle planning game, or not a, not a game, but it's really, how do you predict the future? That's essentially what we're here to do. We're trying to make decisions today that are gonna affect us for a long time. They're gonna impact everything that we do. <clears throat> so stepping back a little bit, how many of you remember this thing? On, have you used it recently? I think they may, you probably see them in jails now a lot, but not out on the street as much. Um, they, uh, they were expensive, they did not work, they tethered you to the wall or the, or the, the floor, uh, they smelled bad, uh, <clears throat> and everything's changed after that. And then we think in terms of documents, and then we went to the, this next level. We were, we were untethered, we can move around, we can make decisions on the fly. Um, but a lot of our world today in facilities is still somewhere in between these two. We're still somewhat tied to our documents, and documents are not necessarily always paper. They're also PDF files and static information. Um, and a lot of the building information modeling and the technology out there is really right there. But we really want to be here. We're all used to this world where we can do anything wherever we want. We can collaborate. We can make changes. And everything has changed. Pre-2007, our world looked like this. And then all of a sudden, we went to this. When we were in this world where we had these mobile bricks, if we wanted to add more functionality, we essentially had to throw all our data away and that brick away and buy the next phone. We couldn't easily even transfer information from one to the next. So the, the platform shift was not necessarily a, a device that didn't have physical buttons. It was much more than that. It was a platform that allowed us to build quick, fast, cheap applications that made our, our life a lot easier. Um, and you did not have to dispose your data. In fact, if I lose my iPhone or my Android, I can basically go buy another one and get my data from the cloud and keep on moving without, without a hiccup, pretty much. <clears throat> so all these apps that have been developed on top of that, the way that we used to think of applications, they used to be very expensive and, and difficult to implement, but now we, they're disposable. We basically plug in, and you don't want a lot of functionality. It's a different world. We're all used to thinking, well, we need more functionality on this application, let's buy it more software or add, ask the vendor to add more functionality, but now you can build things on the fly and add more functionality. So what if we move our world where we are in facilities into this world? <clears throat> and you're going to think that I'm going to be talking a lot about technology, which I am, but ultimately it's not about building cheaper, faster, better, buying the next whiz bang technology. It's not about playing a game on your phone where you have multiple lives. We're dealing with real lives here. Health facilities is not a game. It is about saving lives. This is, uh, I'm, I'm quoting Ashraf Abdullah. Um, we save lives every day with the decisions that we make. The reverse of that, the risk is if we make bad decisions, we impact lives. We impact lives every day. <clears throat> and for the veterans and the men and women who serve our country, it's very important that we think in terms of what we can do, changing our mindset, and moving forward together. And I commend the HFI for being an educational um, organization that's spreading the word. <clears throat> so as an architect, when I heard David Morgridge say that 80% of what we do can be automated, that's a scary thought. I don't know if I necessarily believe that, but even if it was 50% or 30% or 20%, what would that look like? And I would venture to say that at least 10% of what we do today, or maybe more, 30% can and is being automated. <clears throat> We have a lot of good knowledge, collectively. It's in our heads, it's in our books, it's in our standards, it's on our websites, but we can't search it. We can't find it easily. It's very difficult to access. Therefore, that knowledge, the value of it goes down and the risk goes higher if we don't get the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. We have a, typ a typical stack of requirement documents. We have to read through a lot of stuff the requirements, the, the criteria, why do we need to, why are we building this, this operating room? And then having to go out and survey and find out, did we build it this way? 
And last year we talked a little bit about seps to bim, and I'm going to kind of extend on that a little bit today. So we, SEPS has been around a long time, as you know, the Space and Equipment Planning System for, space, for standards and requirements for VA and DHA to capture the institutional knowledge and requirements. And then it was used to be output just as an Excel or PDF files, which then the architect had to read through. With a half a million square foot hospital, it's millions of data points. Read through all the data, convert it, put it into documents, and then hope that it all comes together. And there are, as we all know, there are always errors, and it's very difficult to check that. So what shifted when we started this project with VA and DHA, and Renee and Russ Manning uh, initiated this, uh, how can we not only move SEPs to the web, but make the data accessible so we can build this app culture on top of that? So that happened, so now there's a way to automate where we're taking half a million square foot of SEPs data and it's automatically generating the first version of the BIM with all the data injected in the BIM. This is hundreds and hundreds of hours of manually converting data from one format to the next. This is automation part A, right? <clears throat> and it also extended to other applications. And I asked permission. I'm going to be talking about a lot of case studies of other vendors and applications that have connected to this, just to show that it is happening. So I'm not endorsing any single one, but Revit, Atania, SketchUp, Archicad, and other software have started to connect to this. And even in the last few weeks, things have accelerated even. So it's about sharing the data more efficiently before all the data was locked into applications and now it's all available through SEPs to BIM, publicly accessible. This is another key thing. We made it, we suggested to make a part of it, a lot of the standards publicly accessible as data, which opens up opportunities for others to connect to. The apps that I talked about, you cannot build an app on top of a platform if the platform does not exist. Most owners do not have a platform. SEPS to BIM is the first large scale that I know of owner database that is built on a platform that is available to the world. That is significant. I'm going to say it again. This is a significant step, just like launching the GPS satellites that we're all using, that we have shifted what we can do to reduce risk for our customers, right? So what do we do with that power? It doesn't make sense to share PDF files, to burn things on CD. That's the phone that you're tethered to. We have to move away from that world. And there are going to be casualties, but there are going to be opportunities. And for those that are willing to take the risk and step forward, it's not a risk really. It's actually reducing the risk because the data is easily accessible. So I'm going to get a little techie here, but this is a, a data that we understand. We all understand the concept of a vehicle identification number. What SEPS is essentially doing is declaring what our vehicle identification numbers are for all of our facility requirements, our spaces and equipment, which then allows developers like us or others to build applications on top of, just like you mentioned on the uh, QR codes on the UPD. Um, that makes it easy to build simple apps that are disposable and start building things that we want to do assessments, we want to do QR codes, we want to do checking. That vehicle identification number can track as things happen, as the vehicle is sold, if the owner changes it, if it gets serviced, that you can then query and say, should I buy that car that's been serviced five times a year for a failure in the engine? And then when you dispose it, you can also check it too. So that's a key thing, and, and the ID is not significant. How you build ID is not significant. It's just that you need to have a unique way of finding that piece of data. That's what drives the internet. <clears throat> this is an adaption of Russ Manning's slide, actually. Um, so how does it go into the life cycle? If you don't have good data in the beginning, you're going to be collecting it again to make decisions in the life cycle. So just like we saw with the post-occupancy evaluations, why do we have this room? What was the initial criteria or the concept of operations? If I know what it is and I can query it on my phone and say, does this light make sense here anymore, for example? If I don't, I have to go find that information in the books, the volumes of books that we have. And that gets more expensive over time, as we know. That curve goes up, and uh, we need to shrink the cost of doing that. Oh, this is the 80%. I really think there's probably 80% um, waste in a lot of these processes that can be more, become more efficient. So the owners have uh, requirements. Before, if we go back before SEPs to BIM and SEPs, <coughs> every owner has good knowledge, good data. It's just in the wrong format. 
They have a stack of information. They hire ar architects and say, we want to build a, each of these is a project. We want to build a project. You have to analyze what we're telling you to do. And there are conflicts in the documents, the documentation, as we all know, con conflicting information. Each of the architects have to analyze what they think the owner wants, build the building, and then deliver it back in an inconsistent way, which makes it impossible to go into facility operations. Facility operations is not about one building, it's about a portfolio, especially in this audience. You need to be able to cross-cut and understand what you're building, why you're building it, and where you're building it, and should we do this again. <clears throat> so in this new world with SEPS to BIM, the opportunity is because, and this is just the beginning, there's a lot more that needs to be done. For, the, for example, the criteria of why we're building this operating room exists. It's still in a database that's not accessible. Only the output that says we want an operating room is consistent now, which means as we instruct the AEs to build an operating room, we can track it and across the portfolio as it gets delivered back to us. But as we saw in a lot of the presentations in the last few days, if we understand the why, why are we building this operating room, that data should also be shared, I believe, with the, with the experts out there, which then can give us good advice of why you should or shouldn't do and where you should go with it. It's all just data in many ways, and the data does not have to be complex. It's very simple data in many ways. Start simple. Don't think about the whole elephant. Think about the first piece, because if you don't have the first piece, you're never going to get to the end. <clears throat> so we, we talk about easy to understand standards, and that's what SEPS to BIM really is. It's, they're, they're like Legos. They have to scale with easy, clear rules. The way that you break complexity down is you break it down into small pieces. You give a Lego to a kid, they understand how to put it together. If the rules change and that purple Lego shows up, it fits right in with the other ones. These, this is the rule set of what goes into building anything, essentially. And this is essentially what SEPS to BIM is. It's the spaces, the equipment, the attributes associated with it, and how, how an owner would like to build from that. <clears throat> so, getting a little bit technical here, but it's about equipment, spaces, and projects the data that's shared worldwide, except the project data actually. Spaces and equipment is open to the public. Projects are still secure. But how you put an operating room is not a secret thing. What is a good standard for an operating room should be public. The fact that it's in Afghanistan, yes, that becomes a secret. So that whole cybersecurity part is still very much a part of this. It's not a free for all. Then you build a structure on top like Seps de Vin says, Here how, here's how you get to this data. And this is what happens next. The rest of the industry, says we have solutions that plug into this. We can build new apps that plug into this. We can build apps overnight in some cases that plug into this and give value back to you as the owner. That's the opportunity. This is huge because when you create a consistent base, then people want to build on top of that foundation. If you have a shaky base without clear rules, who wants to come and work on that? It's very risky, it's very costly, and there's minimal value in making mistakes on top of that. So these are some of the, as I said earlier, we're going to have actual names up here, but it's important to show that this is actually happening and it's real. So for example, starting with Revit, we then got SketchUp, Navisworks, ARCHICAD, BIMObject, Atania, said, oh, I see data from SEPS, now I can link Atania equipment data to that. That started happening next year, last year. <laughs> we're having conversations with them ongoing about the next steps. We have op the open source community is building on top of that. Hey, we have open source apps that can build on top of this. We have TriWG, which you'll see in a second, and we want your name up there. This is the messenger. This is not that, this is the full set. This is just the beginning. We want the other consultants, architects, vendors, app developers to help plug into this to build this, this capability up. So case studies, <coughs> TriWG, veteran known small business. They saw an opportunity that we see data from SEPS. We have products that respond to that need. And our products have unique functionality in them that can support the need of the VA and DHA. This is a connection. It's a very simple connection. It says, you have a need, we have a product. And there's other products out there that can do this, obviously. But this is a development of a, a, a medical equipment manufacturer linking into the SEPS data. <clears throat> Next case study. ARCOM, this just came in last night to me and I decided to include it in the slides. I was at the AIA show last week in Orlando. I was talking to ARCOM, which has eSpecs, which we talked to them last year about, SEPS event coming online. I talked to them a little bit about how they can actually plug into it. Within a few days, they said, here's how we can take SEPS output and generate an initial spec 
on the fly based on that project of a clinic that's coming out of SEPS. This is within minutes in some cases, but the first spec that starts aligning with the owner data. Next case study. We might have some, somebody in the room from Sherlock, Smith and Adams. Anybody here? They were here yesterday. Okay, there we go. So last year at this conference, we had this conversation with some of the AEs and Sherlock, Smith and Adams actually started using the output from SAS to automate what used to take a much longer time, and I'm quoting them here, significantly reduced time when laying out furniture and equipment. Planners only need to adjust quantity for the specific project. This helps to provide more accurate layout with the required items from the PFD and the PRC. This is added value that a consultant is giving back to the owner. A great case study, and there are others out there. If you're willing to share them, you want to really see, see what's going on. <clears throat> The open source community. I'm part of the um, National Institute of Building Sciences Building Smart Alliance Thought Leadership, and we, we challenge the thought leadership group, what can we build with open source tools on top of the SEPs to BIM data to take it to the cloud, to build APIs, to link to open source GIS tools that show you how the portfolio works. This is a beginning of an open source application that the source code is public online. Anybody can get it and build functionality on top of that. Open source is an incredibly important concept to, to, chat, to build on top of these complex systems. And we have to get that culture into our industry because we tend to be protected. You can still make a business on top of open source, but we're not going to solve the challenges of sustainability, cost, complexity, rapid change with the way that we're doing it today. So <clears throat> I had a lot of questions from the others in the audience and the others that are not here. Um, we're gonna start free webinars to go more into details of how you can be part of this. So this is starting on, if you go to sepstobim.org, you'll see this, the signups for the free webinars which are starting in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> so last case study here. How many of you have heard of WeWork? A few. You need to see what these guys are doing. This is a very vertically integrated landlord, essentially, that rents out space. You can go online and say, hey, I want an office space, or I want a desk, or I want a conference room, and I need it for the day, the week, the month. <clears throat> online, clear, clearly how you can get it. They're expanding like crazy. They're a multi-billion dollar company now within, I don't know, eight years or so. The way they look at their real estate portfolio is as a system. It's a system of information. There are physical spaces but there are networks of requirements, criteria of what goes into the building. Then it goes into the building. <clears throat> and then, when you're reserving the space, a single person, you go into that conference room. Once you're done with, when you reserve it, they're, they're tracking data. It's big data, they're tracking how is a conference room being used, or do we have enough conference space? And they let the occupants say, well, I didn't really like that conference room, it was too hot or too cold, or I didn't like the color of the wallpaper, the pattern of the wallpaper, it made me very dizzy and we couldn't concentrate. The next day, the facility team has changed the wallpaper in the conference room. It's an immediate occupancy evaluation and a feedback loop. And more importantly, it's feeding back into their database that allows them to go to the next project. So they're, they're using this network around the world to feed knowledge back into their system to make, become more efficient. They're probably way over 80% efficient than what we talked about earlier, but they're very vertically integrated. But it's a great place and a great uh, goal to look at. How can we apply this to a huge, um, o huge owners like you, you guys are rep representing here? <clears throat> so, the interesting thing about WeWork is the building is a network, the building is a sensor, the people are sensors, and it's immediate feedback loop. There's no latency. Immediately, if they see something wrong, light bulb goes out, somebody comes up and fixes the light bulb. Design a new building, take the knowledge da database from that, it's almost like a steps to bin process, feed it into the BIM process and automate the generation of where you put plugs in a room because people like the outlets in a certain place. All that incredibly valuable information. <clears throat> so we talked about satellites last year, again about the shared services. We need to think in terms of how do we share our information and this has actually happened since last year. The Department of State is looking at what happened with SEPS to BIM. They don't do healthcare, actually they do have some healthcare. 
You take the word healthcare out of there, it's basically spaces and equipment and it's data. The DNA is exactly the same. We've seen it across owners. There's, you can switch it out. There's nothing magical about Department of State or healthcare or anything. It's basically spaces, equipment, people, risk, reward, all that stuff. <coughs> so this is a project through the National Institute of Building Sciences that I'm involved with. And essentially, they're, they want to share and learn from what happened here. So important to think in terms of how do you share it. Don't do it alone. The more you can share, the more uh, relevant you become in this whole scenario. So next, we're going to have some audience participation here. This is a break. This is a morning, so we figured we'd do a little break here. OK, so Renee, you're going to help me on this, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to present next. So this is an audience participation segment, a little break. And what we're going to do, how many American history buffs? Oh my gosh, too many. <laughs> OK, everybody who raised your hand just now, you're going to be a judge. Because we're going to ask American history questions. We don't want you shouting out the answer, because we know you are experts in this. But you're going to check on us to make sure we're, we're right. So you can help us be the judge. So first task, very simple task. Open up your devices, whoever has a mobile phone, Launch them, connect to the internet. We're going to do a little search. We're going to search something about history. Not, if you don't want to do this, it's fine, but it would be great if you were A very simple question. And we want you to raise your hand as you find the answer. And we're going to count off one, two, three, four. And we have actually a stack of books here, like $120 worth of books that we're going to be giving out as we, as we move into the next exercise, too. Does that make sense? <laughs> Big BIM 4.0 just came out. Okay, uh, not by me, it's by another author named Finance Jernigan. So you open up your devices, okay, ready? Hold up your devices if you have them ready. Oh, look at all those phones. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the 23rd president? Raise your hand if you know. Not the history buffs. 23rd president, one, two, three, four. I think I saw one, two, three, four back here. Look at that, pretty fast, within seconds, before I even finish the sentence. Okay. What's the answer? Benjamin Harrison. You go. Benjamin Harrison. That's <laughs> Siri. That's the fast way to do it. Okay, so next part two of this is we're going to take who was number one back here? That raise your hand. Number one was there. I think I saw a two and a three and a four over there. We just need four people up here on stage with your phones, the, the non history buff experts. Don't be come shy, on. come on. Come on, there are prizes up here, and it's very simple. It's the same type of question. Whoever wants to come up, please come up. We need two more. Um, you don't have to be the top four. Whoever is up here first. Two more, come on. All right. No more takers? Come on. One more. There oh, we there go. We go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> all right, so we'd like you to sit up here. Actually, two. Two people sit up here and two can stand. You all have phones, right? So two can sit up here. And we're going to ask another question, almost a similar type of question. Two, two more people up here? There's two teams, so we're going to have two I have teams. to search how to do that. Okay, two, people so two teams. teams. Okay, come on up. Do you have the other books? Okay, so here's the next part. Part two is we're going to search again. There's going to be one slight variation to it. Unfortunately, you sat at the desk, so you have to put your phones over here. <laughs> and we're going to give you an American history book. <laughs> and you, can't, you guys can't look at the book. You can't cheat. Oh, no, we don't need to look on your phones. OK. <laughs> OK, ready? Next question. So we have four contestants two on phones, and we're getting somewhere with this, so don't worry about it. It's not going to be difficult. The Great Compromise of 1787 is known by what other name? Provide one name. Sherman Com Compromise. There we go. Okay. That's one. Any others? We just wanted one name. Can you guys find the next one? Connecticut Compromise. That's it. Got two. Okay. Sorry that was a setup, but we'll <laughs> make a point to that. Okay. That was the answer. Connecticut and Sherman. So we're going to go to the next question. Ready?
What year was the landmark Plessy versus Ferguson case decided? This is the last question. May 18th, 1896. Correct. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. <laughs> but everybody gets a book. If <laughs> you participated and you used your phone. So, you tried. You did. Thank you very much. Oh. So, this is Big Ben 4.0. All right. So, let's give a hand to these. Thank you very much. <laughs> very brave. So what have we learned from this exercise? Knowledge in a static format in books is very difficult and time consuming to search. Imagine instead of three questions, there were 3000. Knowledge in a data format is searchable and we're all used to that on our mobile devices. And books or static documents are not easily searchable. Most of our facility data is stuck in a book format and we're searching for information constantly that takes a long time to find. SEPS to BIM changes that. It turns knowledge into data and makes it searchable by anybody. So how many of you actually search for to buy things online? Right? So I'm going to show one thing real quickly before we go there. So the point was we're all used to this. Imagine if SEPS was like that and what we do was like that. And actually it is. We have a new functionality that was put online recently where we actually have a shopping cart. And it's, free, it's a free shopping cart. You don't have to pay for stuff. So you say, uh, I want to find an office. And you search, or you want to find the, 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 the number, and you say, I want one office like this, and two like this, and next. And you have a shopping cart, and it builds a BIM from that. It's as simple as that. So we had questions the other day about how can we do all this complex technology. It's, it's really about bringing the technology to the end user, the people that can make decisions. So that's, that's the um, ending point, and I guess my mic just dropped, so we're going to hear next. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Let's go to back to this. Sorry, it's kind of slipping around up here. But shopping cart. There we go. You can try it yourself on sepstabim.org. Okay, can you hear me all right with the mic? Anybody in the back can't hear me? All right, thank you. So long as I can see how to use this advanced, I always blow the advanced thing, so I'll try to be good. Uh, to start my conversation with you today, I'd like to talk to about two examples of um, conversations and communication um, that I think are, have some context within what we're trying to talk about today. Uh, without clear communication, we really suffer in being able to tell people what we want them to do. The first example is a little story that I read about and saw an example of. Uh, architects and owners were having a review of a complex drawing set. They uh, noticed that there was a, 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 a core bore that was needed in the um, ceiling and uh, for the, the uh, what am I trying to say, the floor, the, the concrete floor above. And so they annotated that there is a need for a core to be bored here and clouded the note and sent it off to the contractor to execute. They came back to do an inspection and lo and behold, when they looked at the ceiling, they noticed that the bore had been done, but the bore wasn't a single hole, it was made like this. All right, he did exactly what he was told to do. It was not at all what the owner wanted, <laughs> I hope. The second example is that a, a, um, a very caring husband goes into the kitchen and watches his, that his wife is really busy trying to get supper ready. And he says, honey, is there something I could do to help you pre sup prepare supper tonight for our guests? And she says, oh yes, I really need some help. Will you please go to this pot of potatoes, peel half of them and put them in water and start them to boil? And then she goes off to set the table. She comes back into the kitchen, and this is what her husband has done. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Did he do what she asked him to do? Yes. Yes. Was this what anybody would normally have assumed it would be done? No. And this is a part of, you know, so the bigger paradigm which we face within the construction, design and construction industry is that oftentimes our instructions are not really as clear as they need to be for the people who are actually trying to do what we want them to do. So I wanted to sort of use a paradigm here to talk about um, sort of the additional information that, uh, moving forward with the SEPs to BIM and what we've tried to do in this last year. But the paradigm is obviously owners are rulers. We have the right to tell people what we want them to do. And because the owners have the gold, <laughs> and whoever makes the gold, who has the gold makes the rules, we have a real responsibility to make sure that we can communicate well to those that we are trying to get to, to help us do what we need them to do. Um, if we don't say things in a way and declare them in a way that can be understood, essentially it's, it's irrelevant. We don't get what we want. But often what we do is write them in some sort of secret code that you have to be initiated to understand. Most people will not understand construction drawings and specifications. But there, we aren't the only ones who do this sort of thing. And there's been a lot of new language that has, um, and diagrammatic language that has grown up over the many years because we haven't had any other way to convey concepts to someone else who's not there um, at the time. So most of you will know that these are basketball play diagrams. But I defy you to know exactly what this means. It's very complicated. Um, and you take a lot of, of knowledge to be able to execute a play. How many people can tell me what this is? All right, this is various sets of ballroom or other dance steps. But this missing a lot of information. This tells you what to do with your feet, if you're lucky and you can understand that. Does it tell you anything about rhythm? Tell you anything about what you do with your hands? What you're supposed to do with the rest of your body? <laughs> It, it's just your hips, your shoulders, everything else, whether you have a partner, whether you don't, all those things are not in these diagrams. So you are left to quite a bit of information that you have to make up. And we know that this is a secret code too. You have to understand how you would make this. It's really quite hard to understand 2D drawing sets. You have to be initiated and trained to be able to do it. So one of the things that we've recently done is in changing our BIM instructions to hopefully make them somewhat more clear as to what we want people to do that design our work and who construct our work. Uh, so our new objectives are these. We want to prove access to health care. We want to execute a facility information lifecycle approach. We want to validate the proposed design solution to make sure that it meets VA's functional needs. We need to achieve improvements in construction and enhance communication and feedback between our team members. To get started to talk to you, I'm going to do just a little bit of show and tell here about where our standards currently are on the web. Many people don't know this, but um, it's very easy to get to you. If you go to Google, and type in technical information library, this is the very first thing that comes up. It's where our information is about um, everything we want you to do. And if you'll notice here on the right, oh, thank Sorry, you, I'm so losing the computer. <laughs> I didn't even notice. Thank you. If you'll notice on the right here, the, whoops, the little circle, that's where the BIM and CAD standards now exist. And there are some new rules here for how to use BIM in VA. Currently, they're broken up into basic four standards. There's a manual. There are drawing deliverable requirements regardless of Probably the biggest change that we have made in, uh, has gotten a seal approval, but I'm not sure everybody really understands exactly what the meaning, how this is really going to change our situation, um, the paradigm 
many constructors are thrilled with this, but it is the first item on this slide, which is that the design intent model is the AE's primary design deliverable to VA. This is really quite different. Almost every AE uses BIM to create what? 2D drawings, right? That is their design deliverable, the 2D drawings. So if you reverse that and say your primary deliverable is the model and we want the drawings as exports, that places a different fiduciary responsibility and the deliverable on the AE that they can't make it up anymore. They have to know how to build, that building is built now. And they can't be cheating, sorry to use the word, in adding details to 2D documents that don't fit within the context of their design. So that's one of the first things we have done. It's also that the design intent model takes precedence over those 2D drawings. And we've got some work to do to clarify our contract language to reinforce this. But this is what we're trying to drive to, to get better clarity and documentation from our AEs in the first place and to help our contractors, which will then help our contractors be able to do what they do. Fit for purpose design validation is important to us. So we're asking to use models to help validate walking routes for medical personnel, to have BIM interactive reviews on visually monitored spaces within the healthcare uh, design, uh, annotate fire petitions, emergency exit and accessibility, and communicating the design aesthetic, meaning things like show, we're gonna ask you to walk us through these spaces virtually. We wanna know how accessible is this stuff can we reach, can we get to things that are in the ceiling plenum that need to be repaired and replaced and um, filters changed and all the things that we have to do to keep that facility moving and, and working for our patients. We want to see our phasing plans and 4D type information and we want to um, have design and construction coordination management, AKA uh, doing basically making sure that everything fits in design so your clash detection has to happen with the architects as well as does it has to have it has to happen during construction with the trades we want to make sure that everything fits the way it's intended to be and it's really important because we have we need to have a life cycle approach to our facilities I think many, th because we have the color of money, we get design money and then another organization gets maintenance money, we have tended to separate those kinds of activities and not really given enough thought to the long-term value of what we have. And I, my personal feeling is that a life cycle approach to understanding our fiduciary uh, responsibility for facilities is important and to not bifurcate it into, well, we're done with the construction, have a good time operating the building. Here is um, some other changes we've made in our instructions uh, to date. Because BIM models are um, accurate and they can be geo-referenced, which then can be used by contractors to place the building in the correct location, we are saying that that's something that our architects have to do is geo-reference the BIM model. We are asking for site civil utilities to be modeled. When we are asking for all building structures, equipment, and, and systems, mechan excuse me, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and technology, especially for hospitals, to be modeled as well. We expect to have construction details fully coordinated with the model, not just taken from some other project and they don't fit this particular building and slapped on a 2D drawing set. We expect people to understand exactly how this building is to be put together. And as I said before, we in the design and construction coordination, BIM coordination reviews, we want to have space reservations for access, repair, equipment removal, and replacement tools medical technology infrastructure modeled at the time of design. So we know that there's perfect, we have access to all those things that have to be done. And we're hoping to coordinate all the efforts and commissioning as well. At the end of a project, 
uh, we're working with our, our facility people to define and have worked with them, define what kind of uh, final deliverables, if you will, um, the information that comes at the end of construction for facility management use. So we want the FM model, which basically is a comprised design intent model, so that it, meaning that if there was some material change to location that the constructor has had to make, they have sent that information back to the architect and the architect has updated their design intent model. We're expecting then 2D drawing sets to be derived from that comprised model. We want the VA um, data file that we've asked for so that it can go into our um, maintenance management for operations. We do want the native construction models when we can get them as well as linked files for things like um, warranties of equipment and cut sheets and all that information. One of the things, as I said earlier, uh, objectives is to help um, improve our construction process. I've noted here a picture of a, a building that was a lease that opened a year ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is an outpatient clinic for VA. If you'll notice on the left-hand side here, there, um, it was a design build IPD type project. Uh, the thing that's unique about this in the sense is that from design through construction took 29 months. Because they integrated their teams, co-located everybody and put the pedal to the metal, we had, were able to deliver care much earlier than we could have done in a regular normal process of which we are now having a a little more complicated, but about the same size of building of which we are projecting it will take about 40 months. There's a lot of value that we get if we can, we can integrate, as Kimon was saying, the data that allows us to move forward more quickly with information. One of the things I wanted to emphasize here, again, um, going back to this whole data life cycle and the bifurcation of, of how we get funding and everything is exactly where the money's being spent during the life cycle of a building. I think many of you already know this, um, and these are relative values, not actual values in terms of um, expenditures. But if we look at a dollar bill and try to proportion how much money is spent for the different activities that occur to bring a building to fruition, you'll notice that the uh, planning is 0.2 cents, design is 0.9 cents, construction 8.7 cents, activation 3.2 cents, and operations is around 87 cents of that dollar. That's a very compelling argument for us to take a life cycle approach to what we do because the value to VA is in that whole dollar, not just a piece of it. These are the, this is this, um, part of the new BIM standard document, this, are, this is uh, information we want during design and construction that will be moved over to facility management to Maximo, which for VA is now our, um, our computer software that we're using to maintain and operate that building. Um, one of the things that I should be saying here is that we've got some new collaboration with the VHA and they're basically seeing how much um, value that the Maximo software will be for them and um, we're trying to coordinate our work together so that they actually we have a we can drive the Maximo value to even a higher level than it had previously by being able to provide this information that comes from design and construction. So going back, harking back to what Kimon had said, if you look at what we're trying to do, these rules and standards that we're trying to put into place, we're starting with the space and equipment planning system, creating a process that moves the program for design and project, uh, preliminary room contents into information that's then um, enlarged by this uh, VAFM build, uh, BIM standard that of data that will go then into be used for one project and put into the building life cycle management tool that then will help VA to be more efficient overall. 
So when we talk about those secret codes and how we actually provide instructions to people about what they're to do, if we owners want better performance from our design and construction partners than we currently get, then it's our responsibility to find better ways to communicate with them. So these basketball instructions are much more difficult to understand than doing this, watching this. And we don't have any sound. Some of you may have seen that game last year. <laughs> so if we're talking about also these secret instructions, we don't really know what these dances look like. But I'm going to show you a clip of Gene Kelly, who is doing tap dancing on roller skates. And I think you would be able to see immediately what maybe somebody wanted if you watched this. Now tell me, could you ever write that down? <laughs> I really. And what we're talking about for us is, is in many ways very similarly complicated. So instead of looking at something like this, there are other options that we have today to convey information that help us understand what we want. And we've seen this kind of work today. What we're not getting is an, uh, changing our documentation and requirements fast enough to be able to get it. And this type of information now, this is a brand new technology I understand that's come out just recently. This was created in about ha half a day. So, if we want to get the perfect building now and forever and ever after. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, even though we are rulers as owners, we're not the real occupants of our buildings. Our royalty is really the people that use our facilities. Thank you. Thousands of files embedded within folders to where 
the model, I can click on it and it automatically takes me to the, the correct OAM model uh, or manual. I'm just curious if, if you guys have looked at that or have heard, um, just because it's kind of an underground thing. So I'm wondering if well, you we that. definitely are, are have that. It's a part of what we're requiring. Have we had anybody do it yet for us? The answer is no. And we're still working because this, this new guidance just came up in um, basically the early part of December. So no, we haven't gone through the whole process yet. But um, yes, that's exactly what we're trying to get to. And we're, I'm working with VHA right now to help them understand what the possibilities are and helping, having them participate in understanding and uh, helping us write the right guidance that they will want. There's, um, when you say, is it round tripping? SEPS is really just a planning system. That's all it does. It, there's really not, as far as I can tell right now, any real reason for us to take anything and on the FM side and push it back through. Certainly the POE should make a difference in how we set, set up, steps up. Um, but in reality, I don't see much of the operations because we don't deal with operations and planning. But uh, we are trying to make sure that how we set the IBM component up, hold the model, and whether there's a round trip between the BIM model and IBM Maximo is something we're in discussion right now. And my second question is, uh, out of curiosity, have you guys played with like some like four-dimensional augmented reality, which is when you superimpose um, the the model itself to help on the project management side? I would love to do that, and clearly it's a high value in construction. Um, so we're going to have to work on trying to get our construction people to put it in our construction projects. <laughs> contracts so that we have that available to us. I, I think so. It's, it's clearly a pretty high value and people are using that now. Can I make some sure. Just a quick uh, response to the Maximo question as well. In the SEPS to BIM strategic plan and follow on uh, Dimmel's FM roadmap for DHA, we actually did prototype how it would come back out. And it's more of a question of can the FM application feed out data into a web service that other applications can tap into. So from a technology perspective, it's certainly possible and it has been done in other scenarios and mixtures of, of uh, systems. It's more of a question from an owner's perspective to ask that of the vendor, whether it's Maximo or whatever. And I know that Maximo has that capability in other scenarios has done that. Um, so it's important to think in those terms. It's not, it's not impossible to do. And then the same thing with our augmented reality, we actually did prototype how that can go into uh, how SEPS can, data can make its way all the way into augmented reality applications. Uh, my question is about technology, I mean, basic connectivity bandwidth, laptops, computers, that type of thing. Background on this, I was with State Department for a while and we were trying to implement some project program management things using um, project server and SQL database. And a lot of times, the, the data we were trying to run was just so it bogged the system down, we couldn't pull it. What are the requirements for this, particularly if we want to use it at the FM level or the 3D models? And, I mean, what kind of technology requirements would we have? Um, excellent question. I can tell you that's, that's a question we're trying to work on right now. Uh, in VA, for instance, I'm pretty sure that DOD has the same problem, is that our OINT department is so heavily engaged in supporting healthcare and the other uh, services that touch veterans that they basically don't have any interest in a little pip sweep or operation even though we spend do billions of dollars, but they just, they don't have any bandwidth for us. And so that's one of the advantages where I'm starting to see in a week, series of week, week long meetings that I'm having with VHA is they are essentially the elephant and the gorilla in the room. And they have this need, they're starting to see the value to this and they're going to hopefully help us be able to engage with OINT to work on that issue. We're not quite at that development stage yet because we haven't. Denver, the hospital that we're building in Denver will likely be one of the first that we're going to get to this point where we're actually moving data into Maximo. It's one of the first we've had Maximo at. 
So we're going to do some learning, trying to figure out exactly how to get that to happen and um, a, a protocol established to make it work. It's the goal that we're going to have to engage OIT and we don't know yet. A part of the success in this, I think, too, is to be able to have, and I've just recently heard that there now are some cloud, um, what do I say, vendors or somebody who's now got security in place that meets the military and the government's requirements. So once, if we can go to the cloud, where we don't actually have to download everything on our own machines, this will be a lot easier question to resolve. But we are still working on some of the stuff. Let me add to that, actually. Uh, as far as bandwidth for the steps to BIM process we showed, it's actually very minimal bandwidth. And because it is in the cloud, it actually it's hitting it. You're asking a request to send me a dental exam or a TG1. It's going to the max.gov server, pulling just that data down, combining with something else, and then building the BIM. So you can do it on your phone, and with, even in a location like this, it has very minimal bandwidth. So the technology out there, we're already used to that with our phones, right? We're not downloading entire Google databases to search for who's the 23rd president. You're hitting that question, going and serving it back to you. And that's the way to, to actually tackle and solve this, is in, think in terms of it not being a monolithic thing that you have to constantly move around. BIM has that, that problem that Revit is a very heavy model, but there are cloud solutions that, that Revit on, um, models and data sit on top of, and you don't necessarily always need the 3D model, for example. You might just want to say, well, I want to query who made that light fixture. That's a very simple transaction, small, very small transaction. And if we break it down to that, then it, it's our, the technology is already there, in other words. It's more about how do we move where we are as an industry and as owners into that world. With, with the challenges that we have with IT, the current IT, too, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's, it's possible. We got one minute. I'm going to override John. We'll do that. So, but if you make this quick. So, in this approach, does a model actually become a contractually binding document as opposed to just a reference? That's, uh, that's a very interesting question and a good one to ask. I think the FAR basically does, obviously does not um, have anything, to, has no language that supports models. And right now our current contract language does not either. I have pushed all of this information over to our um, legal department and I think they are deaf, blind, and dumb when it comes to this because they give me no response whatsoever. So. Um, I'm going to have some meetings with them and try to get them to engage with me. My sense of it is now is that the 2D documentation will continue to be the, the contract document, even if we expect that the primary deliverable of the architect is the model. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out, to be honest with you. But it's, I, I know that in some other cases, there is a lot of discussion. In fact, one of the um, attorneys that I involved uh, who knows a lot about BIM, basically said there is no question in his mind that in terms of risk and liability, the model has more fidelity and less risk involved in it than the 2D documentation which is derived therefrom and often has pieces of it that come from other projects that are not related. So this is something I think is, is going to be an interesting one in progress as to exactly how we have to move forward. And if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear that.